This is Monty Colvin from Galactic Cowboys, and you're listening to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Untied, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is Monty Colvin of the Galactic Cowboys. Yeah, 12 string bass player. Yeah, and he's got his own solo band, Crunchy. Yeah, fantastic interview. Let's get to it. All right, good night. Good night. Monty, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce to you my co-host, Jeff Unty. Monty, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for having me. Hey, I'm sorry about, I'm sorry. this is kind of like last minute, but thanks for doing this kind of last minute for us. We appreciate it. Um, let's get right into it here. Uh, before we dig into your journey into the world of rock music, uh, some of our listeners might not realize that you are a college-educated professional artist. Can you kind of talk about a little bit more about your journey into um, I guess the, you know, educating yourself in art and then going from there. Yeah, I started at a really young age. Um, I just, you know, for some reason I was just drawn to, you know, draw and paint and stuff like that. Took it, uh, all four years in high school. And after high school, I didn't really know what to do with my life. And <laughs> so I decided to go to college and pursue, uh, you know, art, and I ended up getting a degree. And, um, you know, after that, I went into music, but I was always kind of doing it at the same time. I did a lot of uh, album covers and t shirt designs mm -hmm. and stuff like that for my bands. And so, uh, yeah, I've, I've just been doing it for years now. Oh, fantastic. Well, uh, it's been well documented of your use of the twelve string bass. Before we start getting into anything else, it's the twelve string bass is so interesting to me. Uh, you began using it, the twelve string bass. Uh, I guess what the recording of the first Galactic Cowboys album. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about your adaptation into that instrument? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I started out. I found a, an eight string in a pawn shop and. Uh, I was getting into this. I, I had gone to see Lemmy from Motorhead, and he had this just hellacious, distorted sound on his bass. And I just started going, man, I want to, like, you know, add that to my sound. And so I started experimenting with all kinds of, you know, pedals and amps and all this kind of stuff. And I found this old eight-string uh it was like aluminum neck Kramer uh, eight string in a pawn shop. Mm. And I bought it 
and started using that all the time. And I was like playing chords and stuff like that. Cause originally I was a guitar player and I, I was playing, you know, guitar and bands and, and uh, when I switched over to bass, I, I still wanted to, you know, be able to do some of that. And so I kind of adapted a lot of distortion and the multi-string basses. And and then uh, when uh, Galactic Cowboys got signed, I had enough money at the time to, to go get a 12-string. So I had Hamer make me one. And, uh, yeah, I played it on the first album and uh, used to play it live some. And a lot of people... Uh, really seemed to like it so uh, kind of i kind of became i guess known for that kind of thing but <laughs> i i've really over the years gone back to mainly playing uh four strings but i you know i think people still kind of associate me with with the 12s so cool yeah. how much heavier is the 12 string versus the four string is is there a big difference yeah a little bit uh the headstock's kind of heavy on some of them, and uh, I, that was always kind of something I didn't really like. Was that the headstock would kind of tend to fall, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, they are kind of a they're kind of a pain because you know there's a lot of strings to to change and uh, you know that kind of thing. So they do sound cool on certain things. But, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes with them. You know, they, they're kind of a pain at times. Absolutely. I just saw Tom Peterson this past spring. You know, when you think of yeah. the 12-string, you yeah. think of Tom Peterson. Oh, um, yeah, he's the man. He is. As far as, I guess, influential-wise, uh, how influenced was Tom's playing on your style when you picked up the 12-string? Um, yeah, a lot. I always loved Cheap Trick. I loved him. I uh, just did a painting of him, as a matter of fact, because he's just uh, one of the original 12-string uh, mm -hmm. guys. And basically, I think, just pretty much invented it. And uh, so, yeah, I've always been a Tom Peterson fan. And uh, I, I, love the way, I love the way he plays, too. He's just kind of a straightforward, you know, kind of player. He doesn't – he's not real flashy. Uh, you know, he doesn't uh, – do a ton of you know runs and all that and that's kind of my thing too i just like to lay it down and you know keep that rhythm section heavy absolutely uh, years ago we had uh, tony mcalpine on the show and uh, he was playing the eight string guitar and uh, mm -hmm. he, he referred to after years of playing the a string of trying to go back down to a six string he said it felt like playing a banjo for for you <laughs> for you playing the 12 string as long as you did uh, coming back down to play a four string, was it difficult for you to come back down to that basic of a level of an instrument? No, in fact, it felt easier in some ways. <laughs> yeah, I've always kind of played them at the same time. I've never just exclusively played one or the other. Uh, I've still got a couple of eight strings in my collection, and I still play them on certain songs that you know, seem like they would be cool for that kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it actually seemed, I guess, probably a little easier when I, when I go back to the four, you know, mm. you know, as, as a bass player, uh, going from a four to an eight, then to a 12, um, is that just kind of like the natural progression for a bass player to do if they're wanting to jump up to the 12? Is it, do you advise a, a bass player to to adapt to an eight before going like from a four to a twelve? Um, or does it matter? You know, I, I I don't think it matters too much. I mean, there's not a gigantic difference between the twelve and the eight to me. Um, I I I kind of like the eight strings because they they just seem a little cleaner mm. tone wise and. I don't know. I found some of the 12 strings to be a little bit muddy for me and what I was trying to do, because I use a lot of distortion anyway. And so, uh, you know, some of the 12s uh, sounded a little bit muddy. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I would say get good on your four first. And then, you know, if you want to experiment with the other ones, then go for it. Oh, very good.
Jeff, you got the next one? Well, yeah. Back in uh, 2017, the Galactic Cowboys, you guys came out with Long Way Back to the Moon, which was uh, uh, your first album in almost 17 years. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? Sure. Um, yeah, we hadn't done anything for years. And, uh, you know, we played a couple of reunion shows in, an, in there somewhere. But we hadn't, we hadn't done any recording for a long time. And... Just one day I got contacted by this label that was interested in, you know, putting out something else. And they, they, they said, you know, would you guys be willing to get back together and record? And I said, yeah, I think we probably would. And so I talked to the guys and, and we were like, yeah, let's do it. So, you know, we came up with a bunch of songs. We went back and, uh, you know, re-recorded some of the early songs that we'd written, like in the very beginning of the yeah. band, and uh, yeah, it was it was you know it was a lot of fun to do that again. It, it kind of seemed like we'd never would record again, and then all of a sudden there we were, you know, doing another album, and it was it was a lot of fun to be able to do that again. Yeah. Every band and I guess every artist have their own, I guess, philosophy or, or methodology when it comes to writing, recording new music. Um, for you and the rest of the Galactic Cowboys, um, after being gone for so long and getting back together, can you kind of give our listeners, a, 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 I guess, maybe a, 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 some intel on how the Galactic Cowboys conduct their writing and recording? I, It's different ways. Uh I think everyone in the band, you know, writes. Uh, I've always done a lot of writing myself. And uh, I've also done, you know, some solo albums. So I've always had plenty of stuff. But, uh, you know, each album is different. Uh, the last album we did, uh, I got together with our singer, Ben Huggins, uh, you know, a few times before we ever you know started recording and we just got together we shared ideas and i had a lot of music and he had some lyrics and um so that's kind of the way the last album was i had a i, I had a couple of songs that i'd already written completely and we did those and uh you know uh alan i think had a song or two and dane had some ideas that he worked with ben on and uh, through all of it, we just kind of put them all together and uh, had a pretty nice album. Oh, fantastic. After being gone for so long with your bandmates and then reconvening again, was it like business as usual, like it was back in 91? Or did you guys kind of have to reacquaint each other uh, when it came to recording and when it came to songwriting? Um, it it kind of seemed like old times in a way I, you know, I think things, you know, we matured so much over the years, you know, cause when we started, you know, that was 30 years ago, we were different people <laughs> and in a way, you know, I mean, I've changed a lot and, uh, it was actually probably just a little more laid back as far as we just knew we were gonna be able to have some fun again. And so it was really a pretty relaxed atmosphere, you know. I, we were just kind of like, hey, let's just get in there, have some fun, make some music that we like. You know, there's no pressure to have some kind of hit album. We're just gonna, we're just gonna make songs that we like, and uh, that's that's what we did. We just had fun with it. Fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, the opening track in the clouds was one that I read that. What you were talked about like where I think it was originally from like 1989 and uh, can you talk about yeah. that process of that dusting that 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 song off the shelves and bringing it back? Yeah, um, Alan and I, the drummer, uh, we were in a band called The Awful Truth, and we had just quit that band, and so we were like, well, let's start another band, you know. So uh, he came over to my house and. He had some, you know, ideas. Alan also plays guitar, and I do. And we were sitting there jamming on some ideas. And pretty soon, I think it was like maybe the first day that we wrote together, um, we started putting that song together and laid down like a just an instrumental track of it. 
And uh, from there, we hadn't even found a singer yet, but uh, I found Ben was playing in a cover band at the time. And uh, he wanted to, you know, he wanted to play with us. And we got together with him. I brought a four track recorder over to his house and uh, kind of explained what we wanted in the song and what we were thinking. And he, uh, he sang on the demo and we were like, yeah, this works, you know? So we kind of pursued it from there, but that song was basically the first Galactic Cowboy song. Mm -hmm. And we, for some reason, ended up not putting it on any of our albums. <laughs> yeah. and, and then, uh, you know, when it came time for this one, we were like, hey, why don't we go back and, and re-record that song? And really, I, I don't remember changing it that much. Uh, we just, uh, we might have written another verse for it. But outside of that, it was kind of the same as the original demo. We just re-recorded it. And it's still, I think, a really cool song. Mm, yeah. Very much so. Well, since it's been 2017, since the Galactic Cowboys uh, have released their last album, um, as, as far as plans for new Galactic uh, Cowboys material, what are we looking at here? What can you tell our fans and listeners? Well, I wish I could tell you, yeah, we're definitely going to do it. But right now, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know. You know, it, it takes money to make <laughs> albums. Yes. Uh, as you know, hard as that is to believe. And we just, right now, we don't have any backing from labels or anything like that. And we've kind of just been, I don't know, sitting around going, well, <laughs> you know, we'd like to do something, but how are we going to do this? And, you know, when are we going to do this and, and things like that. But, you know, if, yeah, I guess I just keep waiting for, you know, the right time and if it you know if something comes along and and we feel like we can do it you know i'm definitely down and i know uh ben and dane are and so you know we're you know we'd love to do it mm. you know we just uh haven't haven't found a way to do it yet has the band ever looked at doing any type of like crowdfunding anything like that we've talked about that I just, I've never done that for anything. And so I don't really, I don't really know about that. So, mm. you know, if somebody else wanted to do that, <laughs> I'd be into it. But I'm just like, how does that work? You know, we ask the fans to, you know, fund it before we have any product whatsoever. And, you know, I know some bands do that and it yeah. works. So that's a possibility um, that I, you know, yeah, I'd be into that too. So I, I just don't know that I want to do it right now. I'm mm -hmm. kind of busy with other things. So understandable. Oh, yeah. Uh, I guess that would lead to the next question. You talk about labels, no backing from a label. Um, where you guys are at right now, you know, your heritage artist, your heritage act. Um, uh, how, how do you guys in the past, how have you approached dealing with labels? Cause you've dealt with multiple labels since the inception of the Galactic Cowboys. Yeah. Yeah. They're all different. Um, you know, like Geffen, the first one we signed with was this huge deal and they promised us the moon and then didn't come through on any of it. <laughs> and, you know, so after that we were like, well, what do we do now? And then, you know, Brian from Metal Blade came along and, you know, he had heard some new demos that we'd, we'd done and he's like, hey, let's do an album, you know? And so we signed with Metal Blade and he put out like four or five albums by us. And, uh, you know, it, it just, you know, it was great. It was great being with them. But at the same time, you know, I don't know that it was financially, you know, what what he wanted. I don't know. But, you know, we finally had just felt like it ran its course, or at least I did, uh, in 2000. And I was just like, I think I'll just, you know, do some solo records. Uh, I'm kind of tired of beating my head against the wall, you know, with Galactic. And so I basically, you know, kind of quit. We, you know, we basically broke up around 2000. And 
I started doing solo albums and, you know, uh, I signed my solo thing to a label that ended up going bankrupt. Mm. And so we've not had good luck at all with labels. Uh, there was the label that put out the last album that we did in 17. Uh, they more or less flaked on us. You know, they, they put it out, but then didn't do anything with it. And that was disappointing, you know? So I don't know anymore. Um, we just, you know, we're just kind of on our own. We don't have management. We just, you know, we're just, uh, bunch of guys right now that, you know, it'd be nice if someone could, uh, you know, fund the recording or something like that. I'm sure we'd be glad to do something, but it's, uh, it's the industry for me is just, I don't know. It's just kind of a, uh, it just kind of sucks really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's one way to put it. Very, very I don't have so. a lot of good. Yeah. I don't have a lot of good things to say about the <laughs> industry itself. But, uh, you know, it's what it is. Yeah. Well, uh, you've kind of alluded to it a couple times, but uh, my next question was going to be about your, uh, your solo band, Crunchy. Uh, for some of our listeners that might not know you had a solo band, can you give us a little bit of background into the origin of Crunchy and who else uh, played with you? Um, well, it's basically a solo uh, project. Yeah. I, I started out the first one, uh, and was going to make it more of a band image kind of thing. I wrote all the songs and, you know, was going to just do it myself. But uh, I signed with a label that kind of wanted a band image. So I got some guys that were playing in it and that turned into a nightmare. And so I just, from then on out, I just did everything myself. Yeah. I would, you know, hire a drummer. Uh, I don't play drums, but I play everything else. And so, I just started doing albums by myself and now I've got, I've got three crunchy albums. It's basically kind of, uh, a mix between cheap trick, uh, the Ramones, uh, Metallica, uh, that kind of thing, you know, just, uh, more of a, more of a punk pop thing, but you know, still has kind of a, a metal edge to it at times. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, it's me. I do all the vocals and everything. So there's a lot of harmony vocals and a lot of, uh, catchy hooks and good melodies. And, uh, that's what it is. And I haven't actually done anything with that for a while either, but hope to again someday. We hope so. Yeah. I'm on your, ah, cool. uh, <laughs> on the album Loserville, you had, you had Carrie Livgren of Kansas, uh, join you on a uh, track, I believe. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, get, getting him to help you out? Yeah, gladly. Uh, I was a super Kansas fan when I was in high school, yeah. went, went to see them, uh, on one of their early tours and they just blew my mind, but mainly Kerry Livgren. He, he would, mm -hmm. you know, he'd be playing keyboards and I knew he was writing a lot of that stuff and he'd come out and play these guitar solos. And I was just like, I have got to do this. You know, I got to be like Kerry Livgren. And so, um, he kind of influenced a lot of my writing and just wanting to be creative like that. And so, I'd been a fan of his for years and I heard one day that he was talking at this, uh, uh, it was actually a kind of a church thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go see him speak or, you know, see what he has to say. And afterwards he was signing autographs and I walked up to him and I just said, Hey, Carrie, I'm, I'm Monty. I'm in this band Galactic Cowboys. And I figured that would be it. And he looked up at me and he goes, wow, I love you guys. <laughs> and I said, no way. And he's like, oh, yeah, big fan. And I, I thought, this guy likes my stuff, yeah. you know, and I was just blown away. And I, and I said, well, it was amazing to meet you. And I turned and started walking off. And he goes, hey, Monty, would you ever want to play on one of my albums? <laughs> and I go, What? <laughs> You know, and sure enough, he invited me out to his his studio. His, his studio was in Topeka, and I lived in Kansas City at the time. Yeah. And so it was just a short drive, like an hour 
to his studio and I went and uh, I sang vocals on this album that he had that he was doing. And uh, then uh, the next time I, I was recording a, the album for Loserville, uh, I knew a guy that said, uh, you know, hey, you ought to get carried to, to, to play, you know, something. And I go, well, I got a song that I'd love for him to play a guitar solo on. And so I got a hold of him and he's like, yeah, sure. And, you know, he laid it down and it's just made my life complete. It was <laughs> like, it like made everything yes. worth it. Yeah, awesome. Like all the, all the crap that I had ever gone through in the industry or learning how to play or dealing with bands or whatever, like that right there made it all worth it. <laughs> just, because I, I can sit back to this day, and every time I hear his guitar come on that, that song, I'm like, wow, how did that happen? It's <laughs> fantastic. You know? Yeah. I went from, like, this kid trying to learn guitar in my bedroom, and now I have this guy that I used to just idolize and still do, but he's playing on one of my songs, and I just it just blew my mind. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about the uh, Carrie Livgren's The Resurrection of Lazarus album. Uh, you said you were singing backup vocals on that album. Is that correct? Yeah, I did this one little part. Uh, I mean, it's it's really short. But, yeah, I, I went in and he told me, you know, what the part was going to be. And it's really just like uh, a few lines. Mm. But... He, he brought me in the studio and set my mic up. And while he was doing that, he was like asking me questions about, you know, galactic songs. And that was another one of those. Are you kidding moments? <laughs> like, how is this happening? You know, but yeah, he, you know, he, he just told me what he wanted. And, you know, I sang it and then we went out to dinner and, <laughs> and about like 10 years later, or maybe more, maybe it was 20. I think I did that around 2002 or something. Mm. And like, he went through a bunch of stuff too. Like he had a stroke and the whole bit. And I didn't know if it would ever come out, but uh, I got an email from him a couple of, a couple of years ago, or maybe it was a year ago. I can't remember, but he's like, Hey Monty, the album's finally done. I want to send you a copy. <laughs> and so <laughs> he did. And it was, it was, it was wild to hear that again after all these years it like finally happened. Yeah. That's crazy. And you're now a, a backup vocalist on a Christian rock album. How cool is that? Yeah, it's, it's very cool. And, uh, yeah, I got an email the day from somebody that said he had won an award for an album. And I, I messaged him back and I said, was that the Lazarus album that, he won the award for so I didn't hear back yet, but I know he's you know he's doing well now, so that's great. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, that kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, with um, you know, when I was looking at the notes for "Long Way Back to the Moon," all, all four of you guys from uh, Galactic Cowboys, you know, can sing, and you guys do a lot of harmonies and stuff with your songs. Can you just talk a little bit about the dynamics within the band and and and, and coming up with some of those uh, melodic uh, melodic heavy metal? Yeah, um, you know, I uh, when I started the band, I, I wanted to, you know, do something with harmonies because I'd always, I, I grew up listening to like gospel quartet music. Yeah. That's all my folks would let me listen to, actually. <laughs> and my brother, he was listening to the Beatles. Yeah. And, you know, I thought that was so cool. And I wanted to listen to the Beatles for a long time, but my folks wouldn't let me. And, uh, but, you know, as soon as I became, you know, old enough to where I could do what I wanted, you know, naturally, I, you know, went and got some Beatles albums, but I've always been a Beatles fan. I've been a fan of just harmony vocals in yeah, general. So when we got together, I, you know, I started looking for guys that, you know, could sing. I, I wanted everyone in the band to be able to sing. And I knew me and Alan would, and then. You know, I got Ben, and obviously he was going to be the lead singer. And But I, I looked for a, a guitar player that could sing, too. And Dane, you know, was a really good singer. And so one of the first practices we ever had, we just got together and, 
we all took a part on the song and started singing it and it was like just magic like wow that sounds awesome you know so we've been doing that for years now it's just kind of second nature we just sit down and and you know it's usually ben and i have kind of a you know a two-part harmony and then we kind of add in parts from there and uh you know we do a lot of that stuff when we're actually recording sometimes too you know i'll you know we'll hear something and like how about you know what about if we put a another vocal part right there you know so yeah a lot of that stuff we we just kind of naturally do and it's kind of what we do oh so cool it's been well documented back in 91 uh the galactic cowboys released its debut album it was released to critical acclaim yet overshadowed by the grunge movement uh can mm-hmm. you uh talk about the frustrations that you and the rest of the band had when you're excited to have your debut release get overshadowed by a whole overhaul in the music industry yeah that was that was pretty sad because you know they were telling us that we were going to be the next huge thing and then the guy that signed us also signed Nirvana. Mm-hmm. And and then that just exploded. And it's kind of funny because I listened to your uh, the podcast you did with Desmond Child. Yes. Yeah. And and he was talking about how it even affected him. Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, he was writing songs with all these, you know, 80s and, you know, early 90s uh, metal bands, you know, uh, Rat and... Or no, not Rat, but uh, you know uh, Bon Jovi, yes. so forth. You know, and and then suddenly, uh, you know, it's it's just over mm-hmm. for everyone. Yeah. And I've seen, <clears throat> you know, I've seen documentaries about all these other bands that were out at the same time, and they all have the same story. It's like mm-hmm. everything looked great. We were you know, having a blast. We were playing arenas and like the next day we woke up and it was over, you know? Mm -hmm. So I I don't know why that really had to happen. Like I get that, you know, Nirvana, like, you know, exploded and a lot of people liked them. And, you know, I liked them at first, you know, I didn't think it was a big deal, but, you know, I heard the album and thought, yeah, that's really good, you know? Mm. But I, you know, for them to just like that whole movement just to make everything else uncool. I never understood that. Like, you know, why did that have to happen? Yeah. And so, uh, I, I mean, I think there was a group of, of metal heads like myself that, you know, just kind of went on about our business, but, uh, you know, and still like metal and mm-hmm. never stopped. You know, but uh, it just seemed like it, it just became this kind of cool thing that everyone wanted to be, you know, grunge. And, and uh, I don't know. I, I never really understood, you know, the, uh, the total phenomenon of it. But at the same time, there was a lot of cool stuff going on. Alice in Chains was great. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of good music that came out of that. But, you know, it, it was one of those things. It, it definitely affected a lot of bands, including ours. And we were like firsthand. Like, you know, we right. were like, you know, I told somebody the other day, we went to, you know, we went to Geffen on the first album. And they were all like, oh, you guys are going to be huge. Oh, this is awesome. You know, we did an acoustic set for them. You know, for all the people in the in the building at Geffen, and they were just, oh, this is so exciting! Oh, it's going to be great, you know. And and then we, you know, we did a couple of tours, and nothing really happened. And by that point, they had kind of moved on to Geffen. And the next time we did a we did a second album, Space in Your Face, which to me is our best album that we ever did. And we went out there to promote that. At Geffen, and the, the the whole vibe was completely different. Mm. And literally, and I'm not making this up. Uh, as I'm walking out, somebody from the from Geffen walked up with a Nirvana T-shirt and was like, "Here, take one of these. These guys are so cool." 
you know and we were just like wow okay we get it you know <laughs> so it just you know and you know a few months after that i think we were we were dropped and so you know all that was you know tough to go through but it's it's the way the business is it's like you know they jump from one thing to the next and whatever's going to you know sell uh easily is what they're going to go for so we were kind of a we were kind of a hard sell to begin with you know our music was a little bit out there you know in some way so you know it was going to be a, a little bit of a hard sell anyway but then when they found something else that could easily sell they just forgot about us yeah the one thing i, I never understood about how when the grunge movement just changed the industry so drastically is like i don't understand why labels couldn't have two different types of rock genres coexist yeah. at the same time because let's face it you listen to classic rock radio now and you can hear uh poison and then you can hear nirvana and you can then oh, you, yeah. and then you can hear kiss and you can hear pearl jam yeah. so if it can coexist on yeah. classic rock radio now why oh, could yeah. it coexist back then yeah, it all becomes classic rock eventually, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, I don't know either. I, I think that's just the way it was at the time. They were just like, we're gonna put all of our focus into this. It's kind of like, you know, there was a period there where all they were signing was like, you know, '80s hair metal, right? And right. that was the thing. And if you weren't that you know, then they didn't really want to mess with you, you know? And, but they, I mean, that's just kind of way it is. It's not, they're not, uh, you know, people at, at labels in general, unless you're Brian Slagle, who is, you know, has run Metal Blade and stayed true to what he loves for years, and he's still the same. You know, most of the labels, they're there, for a paycheck, just like anybody. And they're not there to be your friend. They're there to, you know, make money for the label. And so whatever is gonna, whatever the hot trend is gonna be, that's what they're gonna go after. And so we weren't, you know, we weren't as cool at the time. And they didn't, I guess, feel like we were gonna make as much money as the grunge band. Mm. So that's the way they go. You know, the funny thing when you uh, raise the uh, topic of 80s hair metal, and, you know, 80s hair metal was not original at all. All it was was a adaptation off 70s glam. Yeah. It, it really wasn't yeah. much of a difference. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like right. it, it never really evolved into anything different. It was just them adapt, adapting from the 70s to the 80s. Yeah. Would agree? Yeah. It was, it was maybe a little harder – edge than just you know basic a lot of it was just kind of you know rock and roll mm -hmm. with a, a metal look to it absolutely you know so yeah i you know a lot of it i hated and there was certain bands that i really liked and still liked that were considered you know hair metal so mm -hmm. that you know you always get you always get the good stuff in there, and then there's going to be a bunch of copies that are not good. <laughs> a lot of those. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because at that point, the labels are just signing anything that will kind of fit into that mold. Exactly. You know, that, cat, that category that they can, you know, go, hey, this is cool too. Why don't you check this out, you know? So, uh, and we kind of, we were kind of in between all that. We were kind of, we were kind of in the Metallica uh, vein, and yet at the same time, we, you know, we weren't like hair really hair metal. We had long hair, but we weren't the party type band that you would think of with with the hair metal stuff. And so, yeah, we kind of we just didn't really fit into anything at that point. <laughs> Well, um, we're getting close to our, our allotted time for the evening, but I got one more question for you, and then we'll leave you alone for the evening. Um, oh, no problem. I ask this question to all of our guests. You're not excluded, so here, this, this is the tough question of the night, all right? So the, okay. uh, the mystery of rock and roll is no longer a thing. With the Internet and then all the social medias out there, 
we've lost the mystery in rock and roll. We, there's no mm-hmm. longer a Kiss, uh, Led Zeppelin, The Doors. There's no there's no mystery anymore. Um, for you, the artist and the fan, you know, what do you prefer? This new age of accessibility? Because if we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be doing this with you tonight. Or do you miss that mystery of rock and roll? Do you miss the Jim Morrison, the Robert Plant, that kind of stuff, the rock star? Um, what I miss were the great bands, like from the seventies, there was something about the late seventies, especially that you just had all this stuff, you know, that, you know, Blue Oyster Cult, Aerosmith, uh, Boston, Van Halen, just all this stuff. And guys were coming up with new guitar sounds and it was just, you know, really to me, great music, Thin Lizzy and just all this great stuff and there's just not a lot of to me like a lot of that stuff going on anymore where there's just like all these great bands Mm. uh coming out that are new and you know i mean i still find some that i really like and uh you know but as a whole, I miss that time, you know, where I could go see Kansas and Peter Frampton on the same bill, and, uh, you know, stuff like mm. that, you know, yep. where everyone, everybody wasn't, you know, fractioned into these uh, categories. And, you know, if you like this, you don't want to like that, you know, and you can't be a fan of this if you like that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I miss a lot of things about that, but. I'm still digging for for new for new stuff. I, I don't find it very often, but every now and then I'll come across a band that I just love. And uh, you know, I mainly, you know, when it comes down to it, it's just about songs. You know, a, a great song is still a great song. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and if it's done well by a, a good band or musician, then it's still good. And it doesn't matter how you get it, whether it's, you know, a vinyl record or, or whatever. A, a great song is still, I think, what people want. Fantastic. Well, we're out of our allotted time for the evening. Is there anything that we left off tonight that you would like to plug or promote? I would. If you don't mind, I'd love to mention my uh, art website. Yeah. Sure. It's, it's montycolvinart.com. And uh, I, I do a bunch of rock star paintings, and you can find prints on there. And it's just uh, my, you know, kind of my tributes to different uh, musicians. I've done everything from Slayer to Dolly Parton. Yeah. And uh, so, and you've also got, you know, there's a, a yeah, cele- there's a, celebrities a, a, and a sports on there, too. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's all kinds of stuff on there. So if you're looking for a great gift for somebody, uh, you know, that likes a certain rock star or something. I got a ton of stuff on there, and that's pretty much, you know, what I focus on right now is just uh, my paintings and things like that. I also have a podcast, Monty's Rockcast. Yeah. Mm. Uh, check that out. Uh, I've been doing that for like 13 years now. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, it, it comes out like once a month. And, um, yeah, if you like a good rock and roll podcast. I talk about all kinds of stuff on their TV, sports, music mainly, but a lot of different things. And so, uh, yeah, those are a couple things. Oh, fantastic. Well, this is how things are going to work out. Uh, once it's ready, Jeff, the editing wizard over here, will get this all polished up and we'll get it sent out to you. Sound good? And please share it wherever yeah. you can. Oh, I sure will. I'll, I'll even talk about it on my podcast. Oh, fantastic. Oh, awesome. so, yeah, just let me know when it is, and I'll I'll pimp it out for you. Thank you so much, Monty. Yeah, you we're, were fantastic. Thanks man, for coming on. Th- thank you guys, too. I appreciate you getting a hold of me and uh, doing this. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was a pleasure. We'll have this out for you. And then I need to talk to you about buying a print of that Peter Frampton <laughs> painting that you did. <laughs> oh, hey, guess what? what? I just sold the actual painting. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, like 30 minutes before I did this podcast. Oh, cool. Uh, I got noticed that I actually sold the real painting. So yeah, let's 
you know, yeah, hook me up on that uh, that Frampton print. That'd be great. I'm not a Peter Frampton comes alive junkie. So like, whenever we go out with the wives or everything, we go to a certain uh, tavern yeah. in our hometown, and I go to the <laughs> Frampton comes alive. I play the entire album every single time. So yeah, it would, nice. When, when I saw you put, when I saw you did that, I say, oh man, I gotta have that. So <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah man. I, uh... Yeah, he was my original influence of, you know, of playing guitar. He's kind of why I started. And this guy wrote me tonight and said, uh, hey, I just bought that Peter Frampton painting, and I'm going to give it to the man himself. Oh, oh so like, cool. What? Yeah, he's got, like, front row seats to the this Frampton show that's coming up in a couple weeks. And apparently he's going to go and try to give it to Peter. So, that was cool. Oh, that's badass. Oh, that's awesome. Well, th- yeah. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. All right. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Take Thanks care. so much. Yeah, have a good one, man. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah,
Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day, all with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts.